On November 3rd, 1988, eight-year-old Maddie Clifton disappeared at around 5 p.m. from her home in Jacksonville, Florida. She was last known to be playing outside before her mother reported her missing. After noticing that her little girl was nowhere to be seen, the search for Maddie soon began, with the FBI getting involved in the desperate hope of locating the young child. Flyers with the picture of the missing girl were passed out around town, and many volunteers from the community offered their support. Unbeknown to the authorities, however, included in those trying to help was the killer himself. Welcome to Twisted Minds. My name is James, and today we take a look at the case of Josh Phillips, a young boy who claimed the life of a young girl by accident. Although, after you hear this awful story, you may think differently. Josh Phillips was born in Pennsylvania on March 17, 1984. His father, Steve, was both an alcoholic and a drug addict who often abused Josh and his mother, Melissa, with Josh and his mother later reporting that they were both terrified of Steve and hated living with him. <laughs> Steve ruled the house like a dictator and forced his family to follow incredibly strict rules. Steve hated it when Josh had friends over and he had an extreme dislike of young girls in particular. On many occasions, Josh was left embarrassed by his father screaming at him and his friends, which often resulted in the other teenagers leaving the house feeling frightened and confused. Josh, however, got the brunt of these moments, having to face the violent wrath of the man afterwards. At some point, the family decided to move to Jacksonville, Florida. Despite being quiet, 14-year-old Josh was known to be friendly and was well-liked by everyone in the neighborhood. One of the neighbors he made friends with was an eight-year-old girl named Maddie Clifton, who lived across the street from him. According to Maddie Clifton's mother, Josh and Maddie were good friends before the incident, despite the age difference. On November 3rd, 1998, Josh broke one of his father's many rules. The rule was that Josh wasn't allowed to have friends over while he was home alone. On that fateful day, eight-year-old Maddie Clifton had walked to 14-year-old Josh's front door and asked if he wanted to play outside. Josh said yes, and the two began a game of baseball. The two were having fun until, during the game, Josh accidentally hit Maddie in the eye with a baseball. She began bleeding, and because of the pain and shock, she began to cry and scream loudly. This terrified Josh because he thought his parents would get home soon and his father would have exploded at the scene. Thoughts of being beaten petrified the boy, and in a snap decision, Josh dragged Maddie inside of the house. As he dragged her through the house and up the stairs, the clothes on her lower half came off. Now, Josh claimed that wasn't meant to happen, but some experts believe that evidence proved that they were intentionally removed. With that being said, an autopsy report stated that there were no signs of sexual crimes. At the time that Maddie was being dragged through the house, Maddie continued to scream in sheer terror. In an attempt to silence the girl, Josh took hold of his baseball bat and hit the poor girl with it. Eventually, the screaming stopped. In fact, all movement from Maddie stopped. Josh decided that the only way to hide the body until he could dispose of it properly was under his waterbed. Yep, he put the corpse of an eight-year-old girl under his bed. Steve and his wife returned home shortly after, acting like nothing was wrong. Josh left his room to speak with them for a little while before going back into his room. To Josh's horror, he realized that Maddie was still moving around beneath the waterbed. He quickly lifted the mattress and heard the young girl moaning softly in agony. The terrifying thought about what Steve would do to him engulfed his mind. Now, he had a half-naked child beaten almost to death lying on his bedroom floor. Josh quickly sneaked down the stairs took a kitchen knife and returned to his bedroom. To silence the girl forever, Josh cut Maddie's throat and then stabbed her in the chest several times before placing the waterbed back on top of her to cover up his heinous crime. When Maddie failed to return home by 5 p.m., her parents grew worried and called the police. Police and family members searched the area for Maddie's body for six days, with Josh being one of the most devoted of the search party. This meant that Josh slept on top of a corpse for almost a week. Despite it being a waterbed mattress, he still would have felt the lump beneath him. 
Here on Twisted Minds, we often see the killer helping out in murder cases and joining in the search parties. Although, this might just seem like the killer is being sick and getting joy out of deceiving everyone in their community, including the victim's family, some experts believe that it is a way for them to stay close to the investigation to reassure themselves that they are not suspected of the crime. After being asked about getting involved in the search party in an interview, Josh replied, I was putting myself in a fantasy world that nothing had happened. That was my defense mechanism for everything when I was a kid. I never made the decision to ignore it. I just did it. On November 10th, however, that fantasy was about to come to a crashing and life-changing end for all the families involved in this awful case. On November 10th, Josh's mom decided to help her son get a head start on cleaning his room. Previously, Josh's father and mother had been nagging him to get it done, but the young teen always had an excuse to avoid it. On the day in question, Josh and Steve left the house at 7 a.m., which gave his mother Melissa a couple hours before work to start cleaning up the mess. As Melissa wondered where she would begin, she noticed a wet spot on the floor at the corner of Josh's soft side water bed. She instantly thought the bed had sprung a leak and touched the side to see how bad the leak was. She realized that it was completely soaked and decided to fix the leak rather than start cleaning. As she lifted the corner of the mattress, she noticed a white sock poking out from under it. Figuring it belonged to her son, she began tugging on it, but to no avail. It was at that time that she noticed black electrical tape on the bed and thought that Josh must have tried to fix the leak previously so that he didn't get in trouble with his father. After removing the tape, she reached back to grab the sock. However, this time, she felt something else. Grabbing her flashlight, Melissa pulled the frame of the bed and reached back inside to grab whatever it was. At the time, she had no idea what she was holding, but whatever it was, it was cold. With Melissa disturbing the bed, trying to see what was beneath it, the stench of decomposition stung her nostrils. Now, everyone knows the horrors that could be living under any teenager's bed, but in the case of Josh Phillips, it was so much worse. Getting a better angle, Josh's mother shone the light into the space and discovered something that she wasn't prepared for. The corpse of the missing girl who lived across the street. Melissa's first thought was to call her husband, but he wasn't at the desk at the time of the phone call. Instead, she left him a frantic message on his answering machine, telling him that it was an emergency. At this point, the police had been in the neighborhood for a week, ever since the disappearance of eight-year-old Maddie Clifton. In fact, she knew that all she needed to do was step outside to find a policeman. Can you imagine being put in that situation? Knowing that you were about to send your own son to prison and change the lives of so many people forever. In an account later shared by Melissa, she said that as she walked out of her house, she looked over at the Clifton house and knew that they still kept some level of hope for their daughter. Now, those hopes were about to be dashed. After finding an officer further up the street, the distraught mother explained what she had discovered in her son's room. He then called for detectives who met her at the house. Melissa was told to stay on the porch while detectives searched the family home. <laughs> Just a few moments later, while sobbing and praying that she somehow got things wrong, Melissa was told that it was true that the body of Maddie had been under her son's bed for a week. Melissa was taken to the police station, with her husband returning to the house after hearing the frantic message left by his wife. Before he could even pull into the driveway, the police intercepted him and took him to the police station. According to Melissa, she stayed in the fetal position all the way to the police station, trying to make sense of the confusion and chaos that suddenly had dropped on her. Josh had been in geography class at school when he was called to the office and met by two detectives who arrested the 14-year-old on suspicion of murder. Once at the police station, Josh was taken alone to a questioning room. After his father, Steve, had been questioned, he was allowed to be with his son. On entering the room, his father asked the young killer if he knew why he was there, to which Josh replied, he had no idea. That is when Steve calmly told him, 
your mom found Maddie in your room. Josh's mother claims that Josh was interviewed a total of five times without his father or lawyer being present. He also made a statement admitting to the crime, but never signed an official confession. The police once told his mother, Melissa, that it was an open and shut case, which, considering all of the details, it really was. Once the media caught on to the development in the case, journalists and TV crews swarmed the house. Detectives investigated the house for a full week after the discovery. They discovered blood splatters on the ceiling fan in Josh's room. The strange thing about the corpse being in the house all that time was that Josh's dog didn't sniff out the decomposition. In fact, a cadaver dog had been outside Josh's open bedroom window for two days before the discovery of Maddie and didn't smell the body. Some have concluded that it was the water mattress and Josh lying on it to seal it around the body that was responsible for the smell not escaping. Also, the Phillips's house had been searched by a half a dozen officers previously, as all houses in the neighborhood were. In fact, Josh's house had been searched three times. Before Melissa and Steve could break the news to their family that their son was the killer of an eight-year-old girl, CNN and other national news agencies beat them to it by plastering Josh's picture all over the newspapers and TV screens across America. In the town's local paper, the Florida Times Union, photographs of the Phillips family home were published along with a full address and map of the neighborhood. This made the media and public frenzy intensify further and put the spotlight on a boy who was once described as quiet and kind. Josh Phillips had had a long history of appealing his sentence. In 2002, an appeals court upheld Phillips' conviction and denied him parole. In 2004, Josh's mother Melissa began to seek a new trial for her son, stating that his young age at the time should have been more of a factor in the harsh sentencing. In 2008, two of the officials behind his original sentence, State Attorney Harry Shorestein and Sheriff Nat Glover, stated that they believed that Josh deserved a jail sentence, but admitted to having second thoughts about the no parole life sentence for a 14-year-old child. In 2012, the US Supreme Court ruled that sentencing juveniles to life in prison without parole is completely unconstitutional. In November 2015, Josh's attorneys considered the Supreme Court ruling as a basis to file a resentencing hearing, and in September 2016, he successfully appealed to the court. Josh was granted a new sentencing hearing and in June 2017, after hearing Maddie's mother plead for the sentence to be upheld, Josh was resentenced to life in prison. Only this time with the eligibility for parole in 2023. This of course doesn't mean that he will be granted freedom in 2023, but it does mean that his attorney has put the chance of putting the case forward that 35 years behind bars should be enough for a teenager who didn't fully understand his actions. Of course, most people's response to that would be, why did Josh finish poor Maddie off with a knife after realizing he had a second chance of letting the girl live? Fear or no fear of his father, the boy would have known that murder is amongst the worst things a person can do. Far worse than having friends over when his parents weren't home. Josh's father, Steve Phillips, died in 2000 from a car accident one year after his son's first trial. Josh has since finished his high school diploma while in prison and is now a law clerk who helps other inmates with legal advice when appealing their cases. I've sat here in, uh, in this courtroom and I have listened to all of the classes that the defendant has been able to take. What classes has Maddie been able to take over the past 18 years? When asked about his crimes, Josh explained that although he feels remorseful for his actions, he thinks he deserves a second chance at life. In 2008, Josh was asked to write an apology letter to the Clifton family, but Josh refused, claiming that he believed he wouldn't be able to convey his full regret with just written words. With that being said, Maddie Clifton's mother has continuously stated that she doesn't ever want to see Josh in person again, not even for an apology. I don't think anyone can blame the woman for feeling that way. Eventually, Josh wrote the letter and read it out in court to Maddie's family. 
Although he did apologize and tell those listening that he regretted his actions all those years ago, there are many who believe that Josh just used the opportunity to speak about himself, to get an attempt, to get sympathy that could lead one day to his freedom. So, should Joshua Phillips be released? Josh was just 14 when he killed Maddie Clifton, but because of the horrific nature of the crime, he was tried as an adult. There was no chance of getting the boy on death row because of his young age, but the state pursued the maximum punishment for first degree murder. While many young criminals go down the wrong routes while incarcerated, Josh claims that he has excelled in prison, only having four minor discrepancies, and claims that he has been completely rehabilitated while behind bars. In fact, Josh once said, I had no clue what life meant, what death meant, nor the depths of suffering that could follow one act. I had no inkling of how long that suffering could last. I did something horrible. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry for what happened. There are many opinions about young killers and if life in prison is a fair punishment. During a time in their life that they are impressionable, confused, and still developing. But should this excuse one of the worst crimes in history? the ending of a young, innocent life before they got the chance to live? Let us know your thoughts in the case of Josh Phillips in the comments section below. Thanks for tuning in to Twisted Minds. That was the case of Josh Phillips, and why don't you go ahead and click on one of the two videos on your screen for another one of our videos.